school student called me up and said, can I have an interview? And yeah, it'd be great. You know, let's talk about wind energy. So the first question out was, do you think wind energy will ever be as big as solar? So fortunately, she was on the phone and I couldn't actually reach out and strangle the student at the point. But um, this is kind of where, where things stand with renewables. Over the decades, renewables really meant hydro, but then other things, you know, thermal came on, wind came on, solar comes on. And what we have now is a, a system where we're starting to get real penetrations from, from renewable energy into our electrical system. And wind is dominating that move into, into renewables right now. In fact, go back to the year 2020, you can see that uh, wind energy was almost half of all the installed past, all the installed new past in the United States that year. And solar is coming on strong. I mean, it's really doing well. I think if you went to 2021, those two roles are reversed. Solar was about half of all of our installed capacity in last year. And then we'll see what happens, happens this year. And what's coming out of the system are generally the fossil plants. I mean, the, uh, the coal is spectrum but there's also some nuclear coming off, aging out of the system. Um, and of course, all the old oil generation that was around, eventually that will all go out. It's not, not really economical. So the development of wind over time has not been smooth. This is the annual installed wind capacity in the United States. You'll see these huge bumps and, and wiggles and it, and it depends on a lot of things. One of them is policy. You know, what's our tax policy? Do the developers know what their costs are gonna be and what the tax treatment will be two years from now. They don't. I mean, so often uh, there'll be a good change in policy and everything will go online and you'll see a big spurt. And then the next year that expires and go away and, and wind goes away. So you'll see these enormous uh, up, up and down in wind. And then the economic downturn, wind is a capital intensive uh, install, installment. If interest rates have a shift, you'll see a massive change in the economics of that. So you'll see. Uh, yeah. 2008 is a big uh, economic downturn. It looks like wind is doing great, but there's about a two year lag between when the downturn happens and when the capacity should be installed. It's just they disappear in years to come. 2020, another big economic downturn. Wind looks good, but now you'll see it come down. It's going to go down a little bit. So, our current installed capacity in the US is about 140 gigawatts. A gigawatt. Everyone knows that's approximately what a major thermal plant would look like. So this is like 140 major thermal plants that have been installed in terms of wind. And, and these installations in the US, 25% of them are all here in the state of Texas. So if you look at which states have got the biggest installation, Texas is by far the highest. If Texas were a country and you look globally, Texas would be easily in the top 10, maybe in the top five countries in the world in uh, installed capacity. So this is really happening as a result of decades of defining costs for wind energy. So where um, we always start this graph in 1980, because that's the year I started working on wind energy. So, you know, the world kind of maps itself by, by me being the center of the universe. Uh, at least I'm always there when I look. Um, but it, it came down and the costs at that time were sometimes infinite because some systems were built that never delivered anything. So if you take and divide by zero, you get a pretty, pretty high cost of energy. But some of the systems broke very quickly. There were high maintenance costs, high installation costs. They didn't produce very much, but over time that cost of energy came down and globally uh, the, the wind installations went up. Till now we're, we're pushing 10% of our electricity in the US just from wind alone. And globally, if you added the wind and solar together, and they're at similar levels, um, you do get for the first time, 2021 uh, was more than 10%. So that's all good, but where are we trying to get to? So if you look at the current administration goals that would say, I need to take the uh, carbon uh, agreement seriously, we want to eliminate the CO2 uh, additions that we're putting into the air what should we do here? And the goal here is to get to a carbon-free electricity economy by 2035. It's only 13 years away. And we want to get to a carbon neutral complete energy system by 2050, which is a ways out, but that adds additional problems because now you have the transportation sector, the industrial sector, and uh, agricultural sector. All these really hard to decarbonize sectors have to be served as well somehow by energy sources that are not dependent on 
fossil fuels and putting CO2 into the atmosphere. So that's a big lift. And I think one of the a realistic question is, is that even possible? I mean, can, I mean, is there enough energy out there to do this? Is, is this something that is gonna cost a thousand times more than, than we're paying right now? Is this even possible? Which is a question I got from my brother-in-law just a week ago, and that's a good brother-in-law question. Um, but we can then look at um, the next slide. If I can get there. We're sorry. Maybe, maybe I ruined it for you. Which is a question that I had a couple of years ago Try talking to. down to uh, an expert in, in the US. Uh, oh, thank you. I can loop back now. So what does it mean? I mean, we have an energy sector now that has 20% uh, nuclear. That's not a carbon emitter. So we've got that there. We've got a little chunk of all the renewables, uh, wind and solar. But we've got about 60% of that grid is coming from fossil sources, uh, coal and natural gas. And we have to replace all of that CO2 emitting energy source with renewables. So essentially, we're looking at a system in round numbers, we've got 20% taken care of by nuclear, but the other 80% has got to come from these, these renewable sources. So essentially, if we're looking at half and half delivery by wind and solar, uh, wind and solar are good partners. Sometimes wind grows, blows stronger at night and you know, when the solar is going away, sometimes weather systems come through that you know, make them match up very well. But that's a big lift. That's a lot more than just 10%. 80% of what we're doing. So round numbers, I'm assuming that we're gonna to have to deliver from where we are now at about 9% up to about 40% of our electricity from wind. And that electricity sector is growing. So do we have the resource to do that is the first question. And I thought this was a question we had answered decades ago when initial studies were done, but not everyone knows it. I was talking to the director of NREL, the smartest energy guy on earth by definition, but he's, he said, I said, well, can wind even do this? Uh, you know, panic came into mind. I thought, I thought everyone knew that, but we don't. But if you look and add up all the resources, exclude all the regions where we can't build wind turbines, for urban reasons for roads, for houses, for all this, take it all out of there. We've still got six to seven times more energy capacity from wind than we need uh, to run the country and the projected need. So the resource is enormous. I mean, that's a simple answer. What about the cost? Wind is really expensive stuff, right? Well, every energy source has its subsidies. So there is a group at Lazard Consultants that tries to strip all those subsidies out and give us an unsubsidized relative cost of energy from the various sources that we've got. And if you look at that, you're left with just three energy generating sources that compete with each other right now. It's wind, it's utility scale solar, and it's natural gas. And in 1920, when this study was done, those were roughly the same. I mean, they, they came in at the, the lowest levels about the same. Of course, since then, we've had gas prices that are going through the roof. We've had interest rates go up substantially, which means those capital intensive um, sources like solar and wind have gone up. So we're looking at energy price increases, but they're all kind of in the same boat. And the, this, coal that's coming off the system is not all driven by policies about CO2, it's driven by cost. Coal is not a, a cheap source. The same with some of the nuclear, same with some of the other sources that are coming offline. So yeah, so we, we have the resource, the costs are reasonable. You know, can we take this and get to that level? Well, so here's a plot that probably brings as much um, confusion as, as resource. But let's just look at what it would take this is not a prediction, it's not a scenario, but we need 650 gigawatts of wind to hit that 40% mark by 2035. What would we do annually to get there? Well, if we look at the installations of 2020, which were about 17 gigawatts, and we approximately double them over a five year period, we ramp up 20% per year and get up there to double in five years and stay at that level for the next 10, we hit that mark. So, is the manufacturing problem so big that we can't do it? And the answer there is no. I mean, that we can actually double the production. We can get there. This is not like an order of magnitude change. That's the main thing. And really there are different markets that we're shooting for. So currently most everything in the US is going in on land, but there's a big push to go offshore. And you saw the resource map 
the offshore resource was, was tremendous. And the offshore resource is very close to the load centers. So you can bring that electricity in where it's needed very quickly. You don't have to transmit over long distances. So there will be development of offshore. The light blue is meant to be shallow water where you can actually stick the foundation of the turbine in the bottom. And then there's a lot of resource where the water is just too deep to do that, where you'll have to float the turbine. And that's a brand new technology. There are maybe 10 floating wind turbines in the world right now, but could we develop that? And that's, that's great opportunity, especially for the West Coast of the United States, which has no shallow water at all. So if we wanna serve California, Oregon and, and uh, Washington, it's all gotta be floating. And there's a great resource off the West Coast. So the story is that, yes, this is possible, but the question is, what does it take to get there? I mean, what are the real issues around getting from where we are, where we've been in kind of a expanding into an open field where every kilowatt hour we could generate can just get absorbed by the system into a system that operates based on the wind and solar that's there, where we have to manage the output. We have to store when we have excess, deliver when there's no resource available, and then control the grid around that. What are those, those, those issues? And I think to think about this, we can kind of think about four generations uh, of wind energy that, that I've witnessed and that we've been through. And in, in a simple sense, the first generation really is about, does it work? I mean, can I put it out there and will it fall back? Will it continue to operate over a long time? Does it work? And the mindset there is, I need to get something installed. I need to get, get off above zero. But if I want to go up a level higher, the next generation, now we have systems that work, but they're too expensive. So I need a low cost system. I need a system that competes and compete with other energy sources. That's generation two. Build a turbine that's optimized and that competes with other sources of electricity. If you can do that, that's great. You might just you know, get up to 5% or, or more. But if you start to get into higher levels, you have to have a plant that is controllable and serves the grid because you're not just throwing energy into the grid. Now you're running the grid. So are there plants now that can actually deliver the services that are needed to run the grid? And that's the generation I would say that we're in right now. And we're focused on what do these plants have to look like and how do we serve the grid? And our aspirational generation, the next generation we wanna to get to is this carbon neutral, carbon free energy system. And that's one, one we wanna to get to. We have to do more than that. So, that's been useful just to look at each generation. The issues around making wind work in the first place were really around, um, I need to have a system that converts moving air into torque. And once I have torque, I can run the generator and I can do wonderful things. But I was really focused on that rotor. What's the aerodynamics? Does it survive? Can I put it out there and will it survive? And one of the most valuable things that we did other than getting through the atmospheric resource and, and the manufacturing issues, is write a standard that says, if this turbine is going to survive, these are the set of conditions it's got to survive uh, in its lifetime. And write that down and force people to design their machines and certify that they've actually got a, a reliable machine. So that was essential. And I think that was done back in the early 90s. The second generation really then becomes, now that I know what my system has to withstand and I can build one that lasts, I have to start to optimize that system. I have to understand how each portion of it interacts with the other portions. And I have to look at different configurations of the wind system. Should I have blades that pitch or don't pitch? Should I have something that is a direct drive generator or with a gearbox and, and other systems? What should my tower look like? How do I manufacture my tower? So there was a lot of work done in system dynamics in integrating these systems and coming up with an aeroelastic system, an aero servo elastic system that you can control and keep it safe and make it low cost. And that was, a, I think, a great thing. Now we're into this idea that I have a plant and I've put many machines out there. It's not just one, the idea of each machine being optimal and because of that, being the best wind system that's possible is no longer viewed as, as, as a, you know, a big enough picture. You have to look at whether the plant as a whole is optimal. And one plant will take energy out of the air, and then the next machine downstream has less. So I block one from the next. I have to deal with this. I have to look at all of the losses that I've got in my plant 
where each machine is making the plant run less than perfectly efficient. I have to deal with that. So there's a lot of work going on around uh, how you deal with wakes, how the wake of one machine impacts the other. Can I steer the wakes? Can I steer the flow through the, through the plant? Like turning the machine a little bit, when I do it, it pushes on the air and it steers the air. So a lot of neat work going on here. And of course the grid stuff is even, even more fascinating. Can I run this plant in a way that provides voltage control for the local grid system? Can I run it that provides frequency control? Can I do fault ride through? In the early days, if there was a fault on the grid and there was a wind plant there, the grid requirement required that the wind plant go away. In other words, get off the grid, let the big guys solve this problem, and then you can reattach and come back in. Well, that's not the case anymore. Every wind plant has to ride through every fault and serve the fault and help the grid recover from it rather than just going away. And that's really the, the world of the future. So a lot of progress is going on here, doing some great things. And that's kind of where we're, we're focused at. To get to the next generation, now you've got to look at the entire energy system, coast to coast. And I know what you're thinking right now. I know we're in Texas. And you think, well, there's a hole in my map. <laughs> Why would that be? And of course, everyone here knows, because this is an energy class, right? The U.S. has three grid systems, East, West, Texas. This study just didn't happen to include Texas, but it was a, an Eastern U.S. and a Western U.S. study. And they, this is looking at a scenario where they said, let's just take an actual week in time in the past. We know the weather for the whole week. We know what the solar would produce. We know what the wind would produce, where. We know the loads everywhere in the country. And let's look at how we could integrate this kind of a future system with wind and solar working together. And this study just went 30% wind and solar and kind of showed that if I had sufficient trans transmission, I could move energy from regions of high capacity here. The sun has come up, solar has come on all over Florida and East Coast, and you're moving energy up into the Northeast, moving it from one balancing region into the other balancing region to serve that. And then as the sun comes down and the solar goes away, now the wind is kicking up in the Midwest. You'll have to move energy to serve that. And you can do this and it works at fairly low penetration levels. To get from 30% to 80% is gonna require a lot more than just transmission. But it does kind of show you how the stepping stones might be as we wanna get from year to year to year as we go up uh, higher and higher in the system. So that's where we're, we're at. These generations have built. So what we learned in the first generation we use to serve the second. And what we learn in the second, we get to the third. So where we are, um, uh, and, and there's an actual learning to, to talk about and how we got from the first generation to the second. Around the year 2000, there was some um, testing done at NASA Ames Wind Tunnel to, took, to look at the aerodynamics of a, of a turbine. Could we actually um, predict the aerodynamics of the machine where we could control all the inputs. So you put it in a, a 120 by 80 foot wind tunnel, design the whole turbine, control everything that's happening on the turbine and ask people to predict how much power is this machine gonna produce under specific controlled inflow conditions. And the, the plot up there shows what the predictions were before the test was run. And the dark line is you know, what actually came out. And the, the idea is nobody, I shouldn't say nobody, but you could not consistently predict the output of the simplest case possible for the wind turbine. And the reason was this turbine that was used for the test was not like other typical turbines. It, it has two blades instead of three. It has untwisted blades instead of twisted blades. So it, if you ask people to apply their tools to something that looked very similar to what they were already building, and had collected data, they could do that. But if you ask them to look at something that was different than what they had already tuned their tools to, to, to hit, they couldn't do it. It was a real eye-opener for the industry to say, if I want to look across possibilities for what I might do with a wind system, I can't actually predict how these new possibilities are going to perform. I can only look at things that are very close to what I already know about or I'm gonna have a problem. So those problems were solved. There's a lot of work on aerodynamics. There was a program called WindPacks with the wind 
energy partnerships and advanced component technology that built on that and really looked at based on good uh, aeroelastic models, what different systems look like. What's a pitch controlled system versus a non-pitch control? If I have aeroelastic tailoring versus not, if I had you know, one kind of a soft tower versus a stiff tower. And I could actually work through those scenarios. And a lot of that work from Winpac, I think, is what fed into this result, which was optimized energy systems. And we were talking about pitch control and, uh, just before the, the, the talk here. And yeah, by putting pitch control in a machine, you're able to reduce the loads in extreme winds enormously. You also have a triply redundant safety system. If I need to shut that machine down, pitching any one of those three blades will stop it. It's gonna stop the machine. So where old machines used to destroy themselves occasionally if they got in a bad spot, it, it was a good system. So sometimes you have to get back to filling in the whole base of the pyramid before you're gonna make a step back up the pyramid. And I think that's kind of where we are now. We're, we're thinking about this future energy system and there's a lot of work that has to be done to make this future energy system work. It's got to have storage and you know we've got to be able to move energy and, and store energy. So there's a example, I think the recent legislation, the bipartisan infrastructure law, the bill uh, is trying to build this infrastructure that we need. You know, can we actually do a future energy system? There is in that bill, I believe, get my decimal point right, about $10 billion designated for hydrogen which may be entirely appropriate because hydrogen may be an important carrier and storage medium for energy in the future, $10 billion. For wind, there's $0.1 billion. So while we're, we're focused up there, which is a good thing, we're maybe forgetting about the foundations because now we need wind systems that are unlike the wind systems that we have today. They really need to be customized for their application, we don't have floating wind turbines. We need floating wind turbines. We don't know the hydrodynamics that goes around that. There are many issues that go on that are going to take us to the top. So what we've been talking about is some of these, what we call grand challenges, those unknowns that are, lie in the bottom of the pyramid that are going to keep us from being agile and innovative around how we build a wind system that's going to serve this system in the future. A few years back, we gathered a, a group under the uh, International Energy Agency uh, topical experts meeting that about 70 people from around the world and asked this question, you know, we wanna to get to that top level, what are we missing? And we wrote a nice, tight, short 160 page report with a lot of uh, tables in it and no one's reading it. But we did decide that we had to have a condensed version. We went to uh, the editors at Science and proposed that we would write a, uh, sort of a review on this and, and, and they bought it. So uh, we, we were able to uh, get that published. I uh, had some good conversations with the editors in getting that paper published because they said, this is, this is too big of a topic. You have to pick, what's the one thing that if you could solve this problem, what's the one thing that would really make wind you know, successful? And I think, our conversation really said, the thing is the system. The thing is that this is such an interrelated system between the atmosphere and the machine and the grid that we can't really do it in, in, in one shot. So they allowed us to actually talk more broadly. And really the, one of the key elements is this is a multi-scale problem in both time and in space. I mean, the energy that we're trying to extract comes from the sun and caused by uneven heating of the earth that causes large flows of air. Those flows of air cause weather. It comes down to the level of what finally gets the wind turbine has turbulence in it that is of a scale that's you know generated by the local terrain and by other machines. And that turbulence changes the dynamics of the jet the power we generate and the power we can deliver depends on whether we predict what's coming next. It's just an integrated problem. And so we did manage to get that published in science. Uh, everybody look it up. It's it's uh, a little tight, but it's kind of high level. And it's got a lot of attention, but we do need to actually say, okay, now what really needs to happen? And now we're trying to drill down from that science article and launch descriptions of what's going on in each of the areas. 
where we went with the science article was that we could simplify this into three major areas where we don't know enough to be successful. One is the atmosphere itself is not well characterized at the scales where wind turbines operate. We know a lot about the atmosphere at some scales, but not where wind turbines operate. Second is that the machines are becoming so big that the design basis, how we understood them when we first created standards and, and design conditions, no longer apply. And they're so flexible that we're into realms of flexibility that have never been analyzed before in human engineering. And it's also a manufacturing problem because we're making things bigger than have ever been made. And finally, this all has to integrate with a grid that's driven by the dynamics of the system. And then besides that, there are either the issues of, of digitalization, massive amounts of data that are being generated, of an education system that's really not well supported uh, for generating expertise around wind and for uh, the system itself as being the problem. So let's take a step back and, and look at what, what wind looks like. Am I out of time yet? Okay, close. As I said, weather patterns come in you know, from global systems and they push air around. From that, we get regional weather created and we call this kind of a mesoscale. But there's a linkage between the two. One drives the other and this local weather drives the flow over a wind plant. So if I had actual wind turbines, each would extract some energy from it and they would dynamically interact with that. And then you get down to a single turbine, it interacts with the turbulence and it creates more turbulence downstream. It's each one of these areas is really fairly well developed. It's really the intersections or the seams between them where we don't understand things very well. And in fact, they link back in the other direction. The individual turbine affects the plant, the plant affects the local weather and so forth. So the weather systems that we generally think about when we predict weather, sit between the global models and what are called micro models. I love aerodynamics because they think, I mean, uh, I'm sure science, but micro means less than a kilometer. So when it's less than a kilometer, it's a mesoscale. We talk about the mesoscale. And all of the dynamics of the wind are modeled, but not explicitly. They're modeled in their effect, but not actually solving for the, the dynamics of what goes on at the micro scale. And what we care about with wind turbines is the micro scale. Every little wiggle changes the loads in the machine, changes the weight, changes the power it produces. It really affects how they perform. Huge issue there. And then if you go from the mesoscale, I like this movie because it kind of gives you a, a bird's eye view of what goes on as we go from high level where things are kind of uniform down to a, a wind plant. This is just five machines off the coast of New Jersey uh, near Atlantic City. Machines operating, we're going to map the wind speed over a plane in color. So red is the highest wind speed, blue is the lowest wind speed. So as this flow comes into the first wind turbine, it extracts energy, it slows down the flow, and this blue plume is what we call the wake. It's the slower speed air behind it, and it changes the flow substantially. So if you look at the next turbine, if they happen to be lined up, the next one is seeing a very different inflow than the turbine in front because it's got that wake coming into it and it's also going to have a poor power performance. So if we want to be able to actually engineer this problem, we've got to look at not just the first turbine getting fresh flow from the wind, but what happens downwind. And we want to be able to model these wakes that come off the turbine, which can go vertically as well as horizontally. It's a huge three-dimensional turbulence problem that needs to be solved. And that machine that we were looking at, it looked like a little blip on there. This is the product line from GE called their Heliot X. It's a 12 megawatt machine. Each blade is over 100 meters long so that the machine itself has a diameter of over 200 meters. Uh, each blade is longer than the largest commercial aircraft currently built. And they're made in a manufacturing process that essentially puts it all together, glues it all up into one piece, ships it out of the factory like that. Huge issues coming up. The blades have been a key to the success of wind energy over time, because if you took a blade from a 1980s wind turbine and simply scaled it up to 100 meters, like a current blade, and compared that to the blades we're making right now, that scaled up blade would weigh 10 times more than a current blade. So essentially, we've engineered around these blades to the point where we're getting 
90% of the weight has come out of it. And we get the same power production because the blade moves faster and we have higher lift air forms. And we actually load that blade just as heavily as the other blade was and carry those loads more efficiently into the hub so that we can do it with less material, less mass and less cost. It's a, but that's a huge manufacturing problem. And it's one that we need to move on to continue to make progress. So these blades uh, now are also uh, made of composite materials. So while I'm manufacturing this in a hundred meter scale, I have to control the process and control the properties down to the millimeter because these are composite materials. And I have bond lines that go in there. I have to control the bonds between things that I'm gluing together to make this work. And then the machine dynamics, because these are now thinner, lighter, more flexible blades, they flex a lot more in the wind and I have to keep that blade under control and, and manage that. And then I put it offshore and I want it to float. So now I have a hydrodynamics problem that we're trying to put on top of the aerodynamics problem. And the machine doesn't sit still anymore. It starts to move and rock a little bit as the waves come out. Huge, huge issue there. So some of the work we've been trying to do is to computationally solve this problem, which is multifaceted and multidimensional. So this is the computational model uh, through the ExaWind project. University of Texas is one of our partners in ExaWind. Uh, but the idea is to model resolve the flow right down to the boundary layer of the blade at the smallest level and up to the turbulent flow that goes around the machine at the highest level. So this is kind of a, a snapshot of a similar simulation, but now with all the turbulent being modeled so that uh, what you see is not a nice smooth outcome from it, but the vortices that come off the back of the machine are mixed by the turbulence. There's another machine down here in that that ingests all of that turbulent flow. And we look at the interactions that can go on on a computational scale. But that's kind of the challenge that's necessary. Question is, how do I believe this simulation? Because where is my experiment big enough to show me that I've actually done this correctly? And one of the huge challenges we've got is the issue of scale and validation of what we're able to do computationally. Just because we can do it does not mean it's relevant. Now we finally get into the third uh, challenge, which is hooking to the grid. That's, a, again, a multi-scale challenge in time often because we have to manage this plant so that it can have feed defaults at microseconds. But I also have to plan it so that the resource is appropriate over decades because I have an investment in this plant that requires a certain energy payoff to work. I have to know what those uh, investments will be over time. So finally, things can kind of come together. I like the simulation, although it's a little bit old because it takes the atmospheric science and simulates a turbulent flow across an actual wind plant. And it models the individual turbines that are in that wind plant and the energy that they extract point by point. And it models the feeder system that collects the energy within the plant and, and buys out control systems that can make that feeder system operate with less losses based on what the dynamics of the input is from the wind. You can see that over time, you're able to produce uh, a system that reduces the electrical losses just by controlling the voltage and controlling the frequency inside the plant. So back to this one, from plant to plant, now we have to actually get this up to the point where we can do that kind of a scale of evaluation and do it on a, on a national scale. So just when we thought we had covered everything, in this science article, people write letters to the editor and say, oh, by the way, you didn't think about the social issues because if you don't deal with people, this is not going to go well. And they were absolutely right. And then somebody else said, oh, you haven't talked about the environmental issues. You know, if you try to build these wind plants where they have a, a negative impact on environmental issues, it's not going to go either. And, and they were absolutely right. And in fact, other people noted that we're talking about replacing you know, the gigawatts on the, on the big system, but wind also has value at very small scale where it might be an individual village or an individual home or a small business where you have a wind plant. All, all good points. So in trying to take this forward, we tried to address them. And let me just note that um, from an environmental perspective, uh, we think that there is, a huge opportunity 
if we can bridge this gap between engineering and environmental science. And we're calling that approach co-design because we do, a, when we engineer any system, when we design a plant, we put all the constraints on that plant and the opportunities in, and we try to come up with an optimal result. Often that is done in absence of the environmental effects and they are looked at afterwards. I say, now I have an optimal plant, I wanna stick it in this site. And someone will say, well, this site has bats in it or has something else. The example I'm showing here is, is the impact that wind has on bats. Um, bats tend to like wind turbines for some reason. So they kind of fly over near them and they can be hit by the wind turbine and killed. Uh, there's one bat species that is already stressed. It's already seeing a problem because of a condition called white nose disease. It's sort of a fungus thing. And their population numbers are really low. So if you now add another stressor on top of that for wind, you may have an issue that is, is uh, dangerous. And where we are now with the numbers, it's, it's not that big a deal. The population handles these kinds of, of losses pretty easily. And we can mitigate some of these by turning off wind plants when we need to. But if we're looking at a 40% penetration of our electrical system and multiplying this by five to get up to what we need to, well then what we're doing now simply doesn't work. It's just not a scalable thing. We're gonna have to deal with this differently. And we're looking at a lot of deterrence ultraviolet deterrence, acoustic deterrence, other things you might do to make sure you bring these numbers down. You can't eliminate any collisions, but you can bring them down where it's at a, a reasonable level. And other you know, species of interest in the US, raptors are always interesting. Uh, the numbers are not great in our uh, interacting with the wind turbines and, and their impact, but they are especially important. Uh, bald eagles, for example, are protected species Although they're plentiful, uh, you can't kill any of them without a permit. So you have to actually go through this process of what's your estimate? How many eagles might be impacted? Do you have a system where you could mitigate or reduce the eagle impacts? Could you turn off machines if you see an eagle in the area? There are systems that are doing that. A lot of work going on. And the sage grouse is really not a matter of, of impacting the birds, but habitat. And you're able to do with that. On, on a personal scale, people scale, often if you're not dealing with the community that is hosting the wind plant site, they may not see value to this uh, installation that's in their community. And if they don't see value in putting wind turbines in their community, there's gonna be growing resistance to doing this. If there's growing resistance, that's gonna show itself in a lot of different ways. One of them is the policies that allow turbines to be installed. So we've done some studies where we looked at setbacks and there's a you know, typical safe things to do. You set back a machine away from a residence, keep it away from a road. Um, but in places where there is uh, hostility towards wind development, you'll see those setback requirements start to grow. And they're kind of used as a surrogate for making sure that wind does not develop, not only close to my house, but, but anywhere. So if you look nationally, We've done some studies where if you had, you know, minimal setbacks, you've got like 15 terawatts of wind available on land. If you have reasonable setbacks that are common throughout the country, that was our base case. That's the 7.8 terawatts, which add two terawatts of, of offshore and you'll come up with the, the original estimate. That's what we have. And that's what we kind of assume is, is a good, you know, rational setback distance. But if you extend them a little further, you start to squeeze out all development between roads and you no longer have a place to put these turbines. Very few, and in fact, that can cause the land-based resource to drop down almost another order of magnitude, down to about two terawatts. So dealing with the communities and making sure that value flows to the community from the installations, not just nationally or not just globally, you know, with some, some uh, climate value, but to the community that hosts the machines and has to have them in the community is critically important. And then the small machines also, because they're small, the physics issues that drive the value or the cost of a small machine are different than they are for, a, you know, the GE Halyon X. It's just not the same world. So research on what makes a cost-effective smaller machine, how they integrate with 
the grid you know, locally, how you make them safe, how you make the cost effective is another critical, critical issue. So when we add that all up, we see that we have uh, about 10, um, 10 areas where we can establish a more detailed description of what the critical elements might be. And, and these are the papers that are now being written and we're gathering them under one journal, Green Energy Science. Um, it has an open review process. It's completely open, so you can link to any one of these while it's under discussion. Uh, five of them have been submitted. One is actually through review already. And uh, from that, we're going to have uh, another gathering of, of ideas around what is the, the scope of work that needs to be done. One thing that's clear to me, oh, I'm sorry, I, we also put in a quick position paper just to describe the, uh, the thing. So if you want a summary of what's going on in this initiative, this is the paper to look up. And it's also on wind, wind energy science, sort of like the editorial. So we look at what's been recommended. I think one of the things that occurs to me is that because of the size of the technology, each machine, you know, maybe 10 to 20 megawatts, it's multiple hundreds of meters in scale. Wind plants cover, you know, many, many kilometers. The experimentation to prove that these models and this, our understanding is valid are enormous. And we have other efforts recommended where we have to do tests at all scales. If we want to look at the, the atmosphere and how it interacts with machines, we have a multi-scale experimentation to do. The cost of these experiments, each one is more than the resource that's dedicated to all of wind energy in the United States. I would say that we may have what you call a bit of a funding mismatch between what's expected and what's actually going into the wind case. So if you look at the research portfolio from uh, the Department of Energy, uh, this is over the last decade approximately, and where have we spent our money? Um, and I'm not saying that any of these uh, are, are not worthy, but we put about 20% fossil, 30% nuclear, you know, 20% each on the efficiency and on grid systems. And then we have a big chunk that's called renewables, but then that's divided between solar and geothermal and wave energy, ocean energy. When you come down to it, uh, less than 5%, it's really about 3% of our research funding goes into wind historically. And I, we're expecting 40% of our electricity to come from wind in the future. And we're putting in 5% of our research to make that happen. It's probably not going to happen. We had about a hundred million dollar a year program. Solar is really in the same position. Solar is expected to do the other 40%. And they uh, are doing better than wind, but not that much better. They had about a $300 million a year program. And you know, at the same time, what I consider to be a huge success, if you look back in time, nuclear was, was brought on from zero to providing 20% of our electricity. And that all happened in about two decades, but it was done with substantial uh, research funding. So I think what we need to do is make sure that we push that funding up to solar and wind. So with that, I just wrap up uh, and say, you know, there's a big system problem to be solved here. There's a lot that we need to understand better to make it work, and we really would love to do that. So thank you very much for your attention. All right, we got a few questions online, but I'll let somebody in the room ask one first. Anyone's question? Yeah. Uh, so, my, yeah, I'll be So, like, while we're designing uh, offshore wind turbine versus a uh, land wind, uh, wind turbine, there are certain design requirements that any design engineer would consider. So, as you mentioned in your slide, that's uh, structural requirement versus the aerodynamic requirements. So what's the basic mindset that a design engineer considers while designing both of these systems? Because they, they are going to be different and their requirements are different. So if you could explain a little more on this. Yeah, so if I understand, you know, how do those systems look offshore versus on land? Because the requirements are different. And, and the requirements are actually quite similar. So if I look at the design requirements for an offshore turbine, they kind of start with the land-based 
requirements and then add to it because there's some additional things you have to deal with offshore. And what's going on now is that it's essentially taken what is a turbine system that is typical of on land and put it offshore. So there hasn't really been a lot of innovation around how do I optimize this offshore machine for the specific requirements of offshore because the risk involved is enormous. And if I take something that's been proven, a system that I know and understand from a decade of, of use of that system and put it offshore in a new environment, I'm minimizing the risk, I'm minimizing the risk. So there's a lot of opportunity space that's limited by the cost and risk of doing something creative and innovative with an offshore system. Uh, ARPA-E is, uh, you know, it's the uh, energy research uh, group. They're funding some things that are looking at really way out their systems for offshore. Things like blades that would uh, morph and, and deform downwind like a palm tree in high winds, you know, and maybe that offers some opportunity. We're looking at vertical axis machines, which were popular back in the 1980s, and they allow you to bring the generator and a lot of the heavy equipment down near the water surface. And that might offer some opportunities. But the industrial uh, risk appetite is not there for taking any of these novel systems and putting them off for where uh, you know you pay a lot if you fail. All right. And at the Question from online here. So, uh, this is sort of a, I don't know, perhaps devil's advocate type of case. Uh, challenge to wind advocates is that it's it's there's a, it's prolific enough. There's enough wind to push a lot of thermal capacity, natural gas, coal power plants out of the grid, but perhaps it has a high enough time to be re not reliable enough to count during peak demand. So, how do you? How do you kind of well, lay off this issue of meeting peaks and instantaneous power versus it can provide a lot of energy? Well, um, I think there's an interesting study that was done by NREL for the city and county of Los Angeles around converting Los Angeles into 100% renewable uh, location. How, how would we do that? And I think uh, phasing and, and being careful about how you step forward with the current assets and transitioning to the new assets is critical. And that study, the recommendation was that these, these uh, gas plants stay online uh, for a very long time because they offer that flexibility and, and real-time dispatchability that you're not going to have in a fully renewable system. As you pull out of that, the next step was, well, maybe you can add hydrogen to the gas, start to decarbonize some of that gas, and maybe then your generators would be fully hydrogen generators. So you're continuing to operate them based on stored energy that's been created when there was abundance and used when you got high demand. So you can never count on your renewables to be present when there's high demand. You just can't. So you have to have a system that allows for coverage during those difficult times. I think that's, and I think the opportunity there is to have a system that's more resilient than the current system, not less. Because if you've designed it to handle those worst case scenarios, then the rest of it should be quite tractable. Thank That's you. a great question. Yeah. I don't know if any of the protractors stop someone from NREL would say you can never count on renewable energy. <laughs> but you have it's, to think about it's weather driven. Yeah. I think yeah. Europe has an interesting phenomenon they call a dumpy flop, yeah. which is a combination of, of cloudiness and, and still air, which comes in you know, not every year, but uh, it's common. And that's the kind of weather condition you have to have as your design constraint on your system. You have to be able to handle that. Right. We will have an ERCOT board member speak on, and his title is talk about Dump the Plata in Texas. So we will hear about that later this semester as well. Uh, any other questions from the room? All the way in the back. Yeah. So you're pretty excited about the floating wind turbines. Is the idea with that to have it capture wave energy as well? Could it be a dual purpose system? Great, great question. The, the topic has come up. Um, it's, it's not an ideal combination because the turbine is trying to occupy a very small spot and, and sit there in the ocean. And to capture wave energy, you need to be over a lot of area capturing that wave energy. So you could do them concurrently or in the same location, but they're not, maybe not as much of a natural uh, combination as you might think. Any other questions in the room? Uh, okay, uh, next. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So um, the 
the win, I mean, potential for winning ten is here, right? Um, I'm thinking what's the percentage right now? And um, so I don't think we have enough plan, you know, it's the wind turbine, right? So what's the potential, what's the, I mean, what's the research going into uh, auto and the FTSO, you know, wind turbine? Okay, if you're asking about the, the combination of land based and offshore, where's yeah. the resource? How much have we got? Mm -hmm. I mean, our, our study for the US, it's going to be different for every, yeah, every location. Years. But in the US, we have a tremendous amount of land. So about 80% of our wind resource is on land. And about 20% is within the narrow strip. Of, I don't know what it might be, 200 mile uh, you know, coastlines around it. Uh, so the bulk of what we have is on land and the ratio of what's available to what we now use is that the total is, is six or seven times what we currently need and what we project to be needed over the next 15 years. So the resource is large, the resource is mostly on land, but those offshore resources are critical because of their location and their quality. These are some of the best wind resources that you can get. We may expect, I don't know if you talk capacity factors, but some of the capacity factors expected for these floating wind turbines off the coast of California and Oregon would be 60% or higher, which is, I mean, starting to look like a fossil plant. It's, uh, it's really very high, very good resource, uh, very good location, but difficult to access because it's in the water. Okay. Yes. I'll ask one more question from online and then come back to the room. Um, you talked about, Sort of system integration, and you so showed the floods are comparison of levelized cost of electricity and different power generation technologies. So, what can you say about how to perceive something like levelized cost of electricity or the average cost of power generation versus the challenges of large scale renewable integration and whether there's a sort of apples to oranges comparison there? How do you think uh, about that? Well, that, that is a great question, and uh, one uh, we were talking about this yesterday. Uh, with the dean, uh, which is what's your what's your metric? And the past metric has been levelized cost of energy because the most valuable thing that renewables have been delivering is bulk electricity. But now we have to talk about the value and timing of that electricity relative to what the grid needs. So so LTOE becomes less and less of a all defining parameter. It's still important. I mean, you still need to have low cost energy but it's less important than it was. So the, the, I don't have an answer for that question because this is an emerging and evolving issue. And I think it probably can't be solved technology by technology, but often we're looking at hybrid plants. So we're gonna have a wind solar storage plant. And what is that plant going to be able to deliver both in terms of total energy and grid services with the resource and the cost of, of installing the plant? I don't know that the technologies can stand alone in that kind of a, uh, of a market. Right. Okay. Um, you mentioned like how unreliable like renewable energy is. I just wanted to kind of understand why it's so difficult to store this energy, um, and if like any efforts are being made to increase like the capacity for storage yeah. of the energy. Well, I well let's get these uh, funding bills out and see what how much was in there for hydrogen as a storage. Hydrogen doesn't generate any electricity. It stores energy. Uh, batteries um, do not generate electricity where they store. So the attention is focused there already. And there are uh, projections that storage costs are going to come way down. They've been falling dramatically over the last decade, battery storage especially, a lot because of the electrical car fleets. Um, and when I say renewable energy is not reliable, that's really not what I said. It's reliable, but its timing is going to be what it is. It's a weather-driven resource. So that means that we have to create a system that is reliable and that integrates the sources and uh, the storage and all of the parts of the system so that it can deliver when the demand is the highest. If nobody cares about 99% of the year, they care about those two hours a year when something doesn't work right. And that's what the system has to deliver. So we can't count on things to just work out well for us you know, because the worst that can happen eventually will happen. And you'll have some deficit of resource 
like the time the load is so high. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that like wind energy and its integration into system is an issue. You also highlighted transmission as a bottleneck. I was kind of curious as to, given that it has proven so difficult to construct new transmission in the United States, what are the potential pathways to kind of delivering the electricity generated if we were to fully tap the U.S. as a resource? Yeah, a great, great question, and, and one that's been drawing a lot of attention. You know, the question essentially, if you didn't catch it, because there are so much difficulty in building transmission, what are the solutions to getting a pathway where we can actually tap the uh, renewable energy? And I think a lot of that has to do with hybrid systems. So if I can build a plant that's hybrid wind, solar, and has a little bit of storage, it can operate without transmitting that energy over long distances. The transmission requirement becomes high when there's a huge abundance of energy in one region, then you want to get that energy out and get it to places where it can be. If you could take that energy and smooth out these abundance times, you know, you may have a lot of wind but no solar, a lot of solar but no wind, or if you have both, you're storing that at that time. Then you can exist within the current transmission system much longer, and you can kind of delay the need to have that additional transmission while you continue to install additional resource from the rules. Uh, can I ask another question? Uh, yes. No? Okay, <laughs> go ahead here. Would you agree with the supply of some of the critical minerals is an issue for scaling up because some of the wind turbines require a lot of errors. You don't yeah. have that much. That's right. Um, that's, that's a topic that some people talk of. Uh, are, are the availability of rare earth elements critical to expanding wind energy. And, and it is, and it is not. I mean, it's, it is like many things, a cost issue. But right now, a lot of wind energy systems are using direct drive generators, which are very large, and they use permanent magnets, which come from rare earths. And that's a really low cost, high efficiency, high value configuration. If that cost goes up, the OEMs will start to look at other systems to bring that cost back out. So it's it's a bit of an elastic uh, system. Um, some some OEMs have decided not to go that route uh, of these large generators because of that, and they're building gearboxes so they can build uh, a gearbox that ups the speed, and now I need less rare earth because my generator runs at higher speed. So there are some big trade-offs. One of the most interesting things is really uh, superconducting generators. BE has got a program where they're looking at superconducting generators and using them for offshore systems. To me, that seems risky, but it has very low use of rare earth, if, if any. So there are solutions out there, uh, and it's a real problem, a real issue, but there are solutions. And the, the more the cost goes up, the more people will drive it for those other, other solutions. All right, maybe we'll go with one more in the room. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so my question was, as we are addressing, like, how do we address the transmission challenges that we see in the offshore wind turbines? Like, as I mentioned, like, I mean, how do we address the off the transmission problem for offshore? Yeah. Boy, good, good one. I'm looking for that. I think there are a lot of um, scenarios for what we might do. I, I like the one which would suggest that there should be uh, a high voltage DC. Uh, interconnect that's off shore that lies parallel to the shore. People have talked about that in the East Coast where transmission tends to run east-west. There's very poor interconnections north and south and having you know, some additional resource offshore that the offshore plants could tap into, but could also be used you know, as an energy transfer mechanism, sort of a backup and reliability for the the onshore system it is really valuable, tremendously expensive uh, endeavor. But I think we're talking about national level uh, resources. So I don't think that expense is out of the question, but it would take a commitment to do it. And, and, and the West Coast, similar problems. I mean, the great resources off the coast of California, Oregon. Interestingly, there are no people up there in the North Coast of California and Oregon. So you actually still have a transmission issue if you want to get that energy down south or up north to Seattle or down to Los Angeles, especially Los Angeles. Transmission is a huge issue. Yeah, no good quick answers. Okay, I think we'll stop it right there. Thank you, Paul Beers. Well, thank you.